All right, as you can imagine, choosing the images and pictures for this presentation was challenging. Um, lots of things to consider. Um, the one thing I'd like to say is, you know, out of, out of all the conferences I attend, this is the one um, I love to be at most, really, because the bar is so high. Um, and, I, and I learn things when I come here, which is not always true for all the conferences I go to, right? A lot of the conferences I go to, it's about mingling and meeting people and that sort of thing. And the actual information content you get from the presentations is, is sometimes not what it might be. This is, I, I get the best of both worlds. I get to mingle with people I respect so much. And, um, and the bar is so high, I learn so much. Um, the downside is the bar is really high and, uh, you know, putting together a presentation for this group is, is more challenging. Uh, <laughs> and especially coming towards the end of it, you know, all these great presentations and then there's me, I'm going, huh. <laughs> you know, if I had to do it over again, <laughs> but, you know, hopefully this will go fine. So I'm going to try something a little bit different. So many conferences and one of the rules of presentations, you don't want you know, the slides to do all the talking, right? You, you know, you, the slides should be sort of backdrop and that sort of thing. My first few slides, I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to let the slides do the talking, okay? So here we go. Okay, point made. All right, so the agenda. I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by implicit versus explicit risk management. Um, uh, the continuum, because there is a continuum. And, uh, and by the way, I haven't spoken on any of this stuff before, so, um, so it'll be interesting to see how it goes. And I, I really will look forward to your feedback as to how interesting, but how useful you'll, you'll find this information. Um, so I'll talk about the continuum, you know, between implicit and explicit risk management. Um, some required elements for explicit risk management. Um, some potential very rudimentary measures for maturity in explicit risk management. Um, and then some of the common executive questions, some of which we've heard in other presentations, but uh, put them in the context of this, you know, why explicit versus implicit risk management, all right? So diving in, implicit, explicit, what, what is it? Um, what I mean is, by example, implicit risk management is essentially saying don't do stupid stuff, all right? All right, this is a bad idea. So if you can't tell, the image is a little tough. This guy is apparently arc welding or something under his truck being held up by a couple of four by fours. I'm guessing, guessing he's angling for a Darwin Award. Um, and he might, might have achieved that, I don't know. But, you know, implicit risk management is essentially, you know, don't do stupid stuff, do this stuff, right? It's essentially giving you a script to operate from, right? And let's imagine, instead of, say, information risk, or information security, let's imagine if we were using an implicit approach to managing our finances, a company's finances. So we make money, well, okay, that's good. We spend money, well, that's necessary. We develop, you know, things to guide us in this endeavor. We educate people on the guidance that we develop, right? We audit test ourselves against you know, these expectations we set. And we fix the deficiencies we find. We very rarely fix the root causes for those deficiencies, which is a, something I'll touch on later. Um, and then we repeat, right? But let's imagine we're doing that in the absence of any financial measurement at all. How successful would we be in terms of managing our finances as an organization. If we didn't actually measure the money and what we spend, it's all just, you know, either a checklist 
or at best a, you know, a qualitative sort of, well, we're, we made high amount of money last quarter and we spent a high amount of money last quarter and our objective is to have moderate profit. But bottom line, this would be a very tough place to be as a business. Would we all, all agree? Right? It would be hard to be successful. Right? But that's where we are in large part as an industry in information security and in other, you know, in risk management uh, in general is this sort of checklist based approach to how we do things. The implication being that if we do these things, these non-stupid things, then we'll be in better position than if we allowed ourselves to do stupid things. And while there's some logic to that and there's some truth to that, there are some serious limitations to it as well. And some underlying assumptions that I think can go horribly wrong regarding are the things on our lists really helping us or are they hurting us, right? Or some combination of them, right? So how many people here have, have been through a checklist, maybe it's the um, bits, sig or whatever checklist, and wondered, you know, why on earth are they expecting that? That doesn't make any sense, that doesn't help us. In fact, it impedes our ability to do the stuff we need to be doing. How many people have kind of thought that way, felt that way about a checklist? It doesn't have to be bits, it can be some other checklist, right? Kind of, what were they thinking, oh my God. Um, so, so all kinds of challenges associated with this, and you know, not the least of which being the fact that we can't really understand, you know, where we are relative to where we think we want to be. Well, part of the problem is we don't really, we haven't really defined where we want to be either. I mean, when all we have is a checklist, you know, about the best we can do is we say, well, we want to be compliant with this checklist. All right, that is about the best we can do from a expectation or objective setting perspective, right? Again, we might infer from that that, you know, if we're compliant, and obviously we infer from that, or the people who are insisting on these things, that we infer that greater compliance means less risk, potentially. Explicit risk management is really more about asking the question, asking and answering the question, how much? It, it really gets to measurement and quantitative values, right? Against clearly defined and measurable objectives. So again, if we went back to financial management, we set financial goals, revenue goals, whatever the case might be, and then we measure ourselves against progress against that. We set objectives, you know, to help us achieve those, and then we measure ourselves against that over time, right? And that allows us to be arguably um, if our methods are right and such, measurements and such, we're going to be, you know, in a better position to achieve and maintain those objectives, right? So explicit risk management is really about this notion of, of measurement and quantitative values. So there's a continuum. Has anybody ever seen the TV show Continuum? I haven't, but they have some cool artwork. So <laughs> is it any good? Do you? Like uh -huh. it, yeah. Okay, I'll have to check it out. Anyway, I like their artwork. So, um, in one of those cruel twists of fate, you know, I published, my book got published last month, and I just barely touched on this explicit versus implicit thing in the book, right? You know, just in the last chapter, just touched on it and kind of got it wrong, I've discovered since then, since I wrote that section. So, Consider this a correction, <laughs> right? In the book, I kind of describe it as this, you know, single straight line continuum, but I don't think it is, right? If we think about, you know, explicit risk management or implicit risk management is really about how we're making decisions, right? What we're basing our decisions on. I see it now as I think about it, and this may evolve too, and you guys may in, in fact instruct me in the course of the questions and answers that occur here. Um, that it's a three-sided thing. We have the implicit, again, sort of the checklist way of driving decisions and actions. We have the intuitive, which is the off-the-cuff sort of shooting from the hip, you know, our intuition and such. And then we have the explicit or measured. That's how I'm seeing it now. 
all right? And so where do we operate as an industry, as a profession, along this? Any suggestions where we primarily operate? What's that? Bottom center. Bottom center? Yeah, somewhere down here. And some organizations are more compliance focused than others, right? To some degree, I would, I would suspect virtually every organization is, is doing some of both, right? And we're trying to, this group, you know, uh, the people in this room, we're trying to push things up and engage that third element, right? That's really what we're about. And as I've begun to think of it in these terms, just really in the process of putting this present presentation together, thank you very much. Um, you know, I've, I've thought, and I haven't had a chance to test this yet other than with people I work with. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking this could be a useful illustration for discussing the issue of explicit, you know, of measurement in our decision making, right? And, and saying, here's, here's where we are, you know, down here, right? And I'll talk in a minute about the pros and cons of each of these because they all have strengths and weaknesses, right? And, and we're never going to, I would guess, we're never going to be purely up here. That's just not realistic, is my expectation. We'll get more into that. But, you know, finding the balance and applying the right approach in the right circumstance, I think, is really important. And it's part of, I think, should be part of the discussion with, within an organization about how are we making risk management decisions? What are the best approaches given a curtain, uh, you know, certain situation, decision-making situation, and understanding how this fits and then making the best choice at that moment for that organization. So I think this could be a useful illustration for having that discussion and, and talking with people. But I you know, certainly welcome your thoughts on that. And, and certainly if you kick this around where you work and find success with it or, or, or not, all right, um, that sort of feedback would be really helpful. So any questions or thoughts just off the cuff on that? I can always count on Patrick. Hey Patrick, I'll time you. We, we should just issue him a microphone. Go. Are you sure? No. No, yeah, bad idea. How, how, I didn't how think did, through it. No, come on. How did you come up with the colors in your triangle? <laughs> Well, actually, I did give it some thought. I'm sure you did. Yeah, um, because colors too, too easily infer, people, people infer things, right, from, from colors that, that you don't intend, right? And, um, and I actually considered not doing any sort of colors, some sort of grayscale thing, but that seems like too much work. So, <laughs> uh, so I'm glad you asked the question. But <clears throat> I... I wanted to avoid green, yellow, and red because the implication of green is better and red is bad and that sort of thing. And so I chose blue, yellow, the primary colors, blue, yellow, and, and red, and chose red at the top for explicit because we all feel good about explicit and it would be harder for us as a group to infer badness from red at the top. So at any rate, it was a risk management choice on my part. and you know. I don't know how that went over, but <clears throat> I did actually think about it. Certainly. Wait a minute, wait a minute. It doesn't really look like a continuum to me because it's stratified into smaller triangles. Well, that was a limitation of the software I was working with. Okay. Because I, I did, I, I, I spent way more hours than I should have putting this together, this image, um, but I, I kind of get, I want to do it right, you know? And so I tried to make my graphic software give me the kind of the, the uh, change in hues and such that I, I wanted to get the point across, and this was about the best I could come up with. Jack? So, and, and by the way, anybody who's artistically inclined and sees a flaw in the actual color, you know, gradation from one end to the other, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I am not an artist, all right? Jack, so, I yeah. just want to make one comment, which is, it's not mine, but I love this phrase. Where the goal is cogency, not verisimilitude, mission accomplished. Oh, thank you.
Appreciate that. So at any rate, this is, this is the continuum as I see it, all right? So the characteristics of you know, implicit risk management you know, actions, and I've talked about this, so actions essentially driven by rote, right? So there's an expectation, logical, illogical, you know, uh, rational or not, but there's some expectation or set of expectations and we just, we do them because that's what's expected of us and that's kind of the decision making mode. And this is at the extreme end, you know, the, hopefully there aren't too many companies that actually operate purely in this mode, right? I would, I would argue that this doesn't occur in, in life, right? The, the purity in, in this end of the spectrum or in any end of the spectrum. Um, no measurements other than say compliance levels. You know, there's no understanding of the relevance of the individual elements in the checklist, right? Unfortunately, that's true in most of the checklists we deal with, right? How many people here are familiar with, you know, a framework, a checklist framework where it actually also gives you some guidance in terms of this element is more important than this element or this element? There aren't very many of those, and there's a good reason for that. The relevance of, you know, you know, password being X number of characters long or whatever the requirement is, is highly dependent on other conditions, right? It would be impossible to create some sort of rational and defensible universal value for each thing in a, in a checklist. That's just not going to happen. Um, but this is kind of that, that extreme end of the continuum. This is what you would see, right? The pros for an implicit risk management, there are hypothetically some advantages. It reduces individual bias. I, as the person executing against this, I don't get to decide you know, what's more important or anything. I just do the checklist, right? I'm not introducing my bias into the process, right? It improves assessment consistency. Everybody's doing it exactly the same way, hypothetically, right? And consistency is generally a good thing, or very often, I won't say generally. It's fast and cheap on the surface. It can be very expensive in the long run, right? And how many people here have actually had to fill out, say, a bits SIG a checklist of seven to 2,200 things. Yeah, you know, that's, that's an experience I wouldn't wish on my, on people I don't like very much, all right? Um, it's, it, it literally crosses over into the painful part and, and contributes, I think, to hair loss and drinking. Um, <laughs> So, but, but other than the time spent on it, it's, it's fast, right? You're not spending time actually thinking, right? You're just checking boxes, right? Um, the the on-the-surface part, I think, in this crowd is pretty obvious, right? We, we, we'll talk, I'll talk more about it. But, but essentially, there's, there's an impression that, you know, this is going to get us where we need to go faster, cheaper than, than if we actually spend time thinking about things and analyzing things. I don't know how many times I get skeptics saying, well, we don't have time or resources to spend actually doing analysis and, and quantifying things. Um, that's too expensive. And I lo you know, at first I cringe when I hear that and then we get into the debate and you know, I start articulating things about um, cost benefit and, and making smarter choices and actually potentially being more cost effective in your risk management abilities than, than if you just did this. So, yeah, again, reduces the need for subject matter expertise, reduces the need for data analysis, right? The cons, well, it systematizes bias. Whoever put that together, whatever their biases were, is now systematized in your organization and how you manage risk. And that can be a very bad thing. How many people have here, in here have seen checklists, again, where you just go, holy smoke, this person had no clue what they were doing. The, the very first 
Let me ask a question first. I better be careful here. Was anybody in here on the, um, or you know, listening, watching, you know, in the future in the recorded session, uh, a part of the group that put together the first PCI checklist? It doesn't matter if you were or not. I'm going to say what I'm going to say anyway. Um, <laughs> that day, I remember distinctly when I saw that checklist, I said, whoever put this together has no freaking clue. I know him. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, and, but here's, here's the thing, too. Something like that doesn't come together in a vacuum, right? What typically happens with checklists and things of that nature, you know, you have a lot of cooks in the kitchen. And, and typically what you end up with is a Franken framework, what I refer to as a Franken framework, right? It is a hodgepodge of ideas and biases and that sort of thing that ends up being, you know, not only systematizing one person's bias, but essentially, you know, disconnected sets of biases and such. And uh, they never, the first, the first of anything is rarely very good, especially if it's trying to do something like this. Uh, typically, it, it gets better and better. Um, and, and, you know, to give the PCI checklist credit, it has gotten better, right? Uh, but that first day was, um, that was, that was something I don't care to relive. Although I did relive it recently with the uh, NIST CSF. So um, it, the other con is eliminates the cost benefit optimization opportunity, right? And, and this is something I, I think, I, I try to mention this every time I get in front of a group of people. Our job is not to help our organizations manage risk or do security. That is not our job. Our job is to help our organizations manage risk and do security cost effectively. All right? If we exclude that cost effective element, we have abdicated, I think, an important part of our role and responsibility. Because, you know, organizations compete on many levels, one of which is cost effectiveness, right? And if we can help our organization be more cost effective in its risk management than its competition, then on that level we have won that part of the competition, right? If we abdicate that opportunity to contribute, right, then I, I think we've fallen down on the job. You know, if an organization is purely following a script and how it manages risk, then it is completely forgone that opportunity to, to uh, compete. Right. So intuitive risk management, all right, leverages. We talked a fair amount about this, right, in, in the course of the last day and a half. You know, mental mo models, right, that's it's shooting from the hip. That's medium risk, all right? So the mental models, and we said, like we said, all, all decisions are based on some sort of model. In this case, it's mental models. And the data is whatever they grasp out of their, their memory, right? Or is at, at close hand. And it doesn't leverage formal analysis, right? Um, the pros for this is fast and cheap on the surface again, right? Again, it doesn't take any time at all to stick a wet finger in the air. It doesn't require formal measurements, that sort of thing. The cons? Well, that's where more personal bias gets into play, right? People's mental models are flawed either, you know, in, their, in how they're constructed or how they're biased, right? What's, what's missing and what people tend to emphasize within their mental models. Um, greater potential for inaccuracy, again, in part because of the models, in part because the, the data that they're operating from. Uh, but greater potential for inaccuracy. Um, efficacy is highly dependent then on the practitioner's experience and, and their critical thinking skills and, you know, that sort of thing. I have met people in our industry who have, through their experience and their critical thinking skills, they, have, they seem to have a very strong intuitive sense of, you know, which things represent higher risk than other things, right? 
And then when you, you know, they, they stick a wet finger in there and they say medium risk or whatever, and, um, and you say, tell me about that, they can actually tell you in cogent terms that stand up, you know, because um, I like, when people give me a qualitative risk rating, high, medium, or low, or whatever, um, one of my favorite things to do is start asking questions. Really, how did you come to that, all right? And most of the time, and I try to, I try to be gentle in that because it generally doesn't turn out well for them, <laughs> right? Um, it is really unusual for them to be able to defend it, all right? And, um, and if they came up, if their result of medium risk um, ends up sounding accurate, assuming we can come to an agreement on what medium risk represents, um, it's generally by chance rather than actually thinking through the problem very effectively. Um, but sometimes you run into somebody who can really, I mean, their mind is that quick and their experience is that good that, you know, they more often than not, their intuitive sense of, of, of how concerned they should be about one thing or another is pretty good. But it, you know, that's not the general case, right? So explicit risk management, well, it's, it's about measurements within the context of an objective, right? What are we aiming for? And it's not, so I, that notion of objectives is really important because um, without that, I mean, we can measure till the cows come home, but unless we know what we're measuring against and trying to get to, you know, what was that conversation with the cat and Alice, of, you know, Alice in Wonderland, right? Alice is trying to get somewhere and the cat's saying, well, where are you trying to go? And she goes, well, I don't know as long as I get there. And he goes, well, you know, then choose a direction and just go, right? So this notion of clear objectives um, is a critical part of explicit risk management. Um, and of course, the measurements are more likely to be quantitative. And hopefully quantitative in the sense that we've been talking about in, in uh, the presentations here. So the pros of explicit risk management, well, it enables optimized decisions, right? It enables us to meet that objective of cost effectiveness in our management of risk, prioritizing properly choosing better solutions. I mean, there's, when our solution selection, you know, there's always more than one way to skin a cat, right? And if I'm able to determine which one has given me the best return on my effort or investment, then again, it's an op opportunity there. I'll give you an example of that. So um, this was a few years back, but uh, CISO I know was, his organization, it turned out, was subject to PCI, right? And they had databases with ungodly amounts of sensitive consumer information, credit card information and such. And so, you know, they brought in a PCI auditor and PCI auditor says, your data at rest isn't encrypted. Your databases with these huge amounts of information, that's not encrypted. And thou shalt encrypt. You know, he knew this was not good news. And he, so he talked to the encryption vendors who said, um, well, we haven't done anything that big with that throughput requirement before, but we'd be happy to try. And it will cost you this many million do millions of dollars. It'll probably take about 18 months, and it will break business process. You'll have to rewrite a bunch of applications and such. And so the cost was going to be significant. And so working with him, we did a risk analysis around, all right, current state, you know, unencrypted data at rest, how much risk is associated with different types of uh, events. And then if you employ encryption, how much less risk? Well, it turns out encryption only applied to, was relevant in a couple of those scenarios, right? And so we looked at alternative sets of controls, not encryption, right? And did a series of analyses around that and came to the conclusion that encryption was not the better option from risk, you know, uh, cost-benefit perspective, they could deploy these other alternative controls and actually reduce risk more at a fraction of the cost. And so when the auditor, you know, they put that in front of the auditor and the auditor said, well, I can't argue with that. And that's what they did. All right. So they saved a boatload of money. But they could have instead just spent millions of dollars and chosen to, you know, do what the checklist said. 
right? Um, this might be something that will, people will squint at and, and take issue with, right? Reduces the potential for severe bias. But that's only true if your methods are right. Because certainly quantitative analysis can be gamed like anything else, right? But if it's done right using methods that, that are correct and um, has the proper reviews and all that good stuff, it can stand up to scrutiny, then this should be a true statement. Okay. And, you know, we talked about um, how, uh, you know, when, when skeptics are, are, are casting aspersions on quantitative analysis, and, you know, it's too hard or whatever the case might be, you know, one of the, one of the comebacks should always be as opposed to what, right? Well, that's you know, when people say, well, quantitative analysis, you can game that as if you can't game a qualitative analysis. Yeah, well, I think we heard examples of that earlier where someone said they incre you know, somebody increased the level of risk in it because it wasn't getting enough visibility. That's gaming it for an agenda, right? You can do that all day long, right? But if you're doing this correctly, that should be much harder. It's actually easier to game things qualitatively than quantitatively. I would argue, because it's so hard to push back on. So the cons, there are cons for what we propose to do, right? It's more expensive on the surface, right? Again, I would argue at the end of the day, it should allow us to be more cost effective in most circumstances. It does take more time, it does require well-defined models, and it requires more purposeful and intentional measurements. Right? But I think, I would guess that most of us in this room figure that the pros generally outweigh the cons in most circumstances, right? But that, that issue of in most circumstances is, is an important one to think about. Because at the end of the day, kind of where you operate within this continuum is going to be a little bit based on what problem you're trying to solve, right? So if your problem is uh, we're having to make the regulators, you know, not beat us up, right, then maybe for whatever you're dealing with at the time, it's about the checklist, right? Or if you're dealing with some event somewhere else, you know, something that's, that's really immediate, right? It's, 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 it's an ongoing incident. It's something that's happening now and you have to make a choice between doing this or doing that, right? Prioritization, right? And time is of the essence, right? Well, checklists don't typically help you with those, right? They don't help you prioritize. They just can't, right? You don't necessarily have time for this, right? Although in many cases, quick and dirty this is still better than this, right? But my point is this, you know, as there, there are certain parts of our decision landscape that are best served by that. There are others that are best served by this and the others that are best served that, by that, right? But what's important is that we recognize those situations and we have in our kit the ability to de do each of these well, right? If we're great at this, then those are the only questions we're going to be good at dealing with, right? If we're lucky enough to be good at this, and that's in large part luck, not just luck. I mean, so one thing I'll say about intuitive, I, I would make the case, I haven't done a study on this, maybe I should, but I would make a case that having um, a more formally refined model like FAIR to operate from, I'm more comfortable with my intuitive compass than I was before I had fair. And, I, and so when I stick a wet finger in the air, I'm more comfortable that I can defend it because I have a model external to what you know, I operate from. Now, I'm still subject, to, of course, to biases and, and all that good stuff, but I, you, know, you try to compensate for that in, in different ways. 
But at the end of the day, it's still probably, I feel comfortable saying, I'm better at this now than I was, say, 10 years ago or 12 years ago. Right? So having a decent external model to help calibrate your mental models, I think, can improve this. But it still carries all the challenges that we've talked about you know, for the last day and a half. And then, of course, there are, you know, part of our problem space, I think, requires this. And so we need to be good at this, too, right? So, and I, again, I think the better we are at this, that's going to help this. And it actually, I think, can help this, too. Because when we're given a checklist, and again, checklists don't help us prioritize. So whatever checklist we're having to operate from, we go through a checklist and we find five things that aren't the way they're supposed to be. Which one is most important? Well, we can, because we have to prioritize those things too. We can't do you know, everything we find wrong in a checklist. So we fall back to this or this to help us make that prioritization or choose our solution, right? So even if we think we're doing just this, at the end of the day, we're having to do this and or this as well. So again, it's, it's a continuum, all of which will play a part of, of our decision making and, and risk management. Regardless, and you know, we might like to always be up here, but that's not going to happen. Any questions on that? Okay. So required elements for explicit risk management. Uh, with this group, this is probably fairly self-evident. Um, clear definition of risk management. All right, which I'll get to in a minute, um, because you know. Risk, if we can't define risk, uh, you know, defining risk management is going to be problematic, okay? Uh, along the same lines, normalized nomenclature and concepts. Um, don't need to beat that drum anymore, I think, today. Useful models, accurate data, all right? I didn't say a lot of data, I said accurate data. Effective analysis, right? And so uh, a part of this is critical thinking skills. I, you know, I, people ask me what I look for when I hire someone. Uh, when I was a CISO and I was hiring people from my organization, um, most of the positions I would fill, you know, I might have people in sort of highly technical roles that didn't require analysis so much, but more just specific subject matter expertise. But outside of that, the thing that I was always top of my list was critical thinking skills. And when I speak to, say, you know, in college classes, and, and people ask me, well, you know, if I want to get into this field, what, what do I need? I say, you better be a critical thinker. So if you're not, find something else to do, right? And that helps us with this. Because you can have useful models and accurate data, but models are never perfect. And the problems that we solve models with are typically fairly complex, right? And the models are never going to match it exactly. So you have to think critically. Um, and clearly defined objectives. And again, that's something that I think is maybe not the most obvious part of you know, this whole, what do you need to do to be managing risk explicitly? Well, you need clearly defined objective that you can aim for and measure towards. So this is the ISO definition of risk management. Um, and I'm not going to spend any time on it. All right. This is how I view it, all right? Um, I believe in clear, concise, and useful. Anything that I put in front of somebody else, I try to make, and you guys can give me feedback about this, but I try to make it clear, concise, and useful, right? And so this is my definition for risk management, cost effectively achieving and maintaining an acceptable level of risk, all right? And that cost effectively, I've already talked about that, but that's, I think, a critical part. And we could have a definition that doesn't have cost effectively in there. You know, achieving and maintaining acceptable level of risk, uh, argument can be mean that's a definition of risk management. That's not the definition I want to operate from. Again, part of my definition is to give me an objective to shoot for, right? So cost effectively is an important part of that. Achieving and maintaining implies measurement. Achieving what, right? You have to have that objective, and you have to be able to measure whether you've achieved it or not, and then be able to maintain it in a highly dynamic environment. An acceptable level of risk. 
Well, that implies somebody's made decisions on what's good or bad from a, you know, objective perspective, right? And then, of course, this whole thing about risk and making sure that we're really, really clear on what we mean here, right? So that, to me, is, is a clear, concise, and useful definition for risk management that, that I find helpful. Um, so more about nomenclature and concepts and, and thinking about it in terms of, you know, maturity levels, right? Um, we can have glossaries and, and common bodies of knowledge, right? And there's, you know, there are a lot of glossaries already out there on risk management, right? And some of them even try to be, um, you know, kind of universal in their, you know, the one definition to rule them all sort of thing. Um, but, you know, we've got all these guidances out there on nomenclature. Uh, but the problem is, until it's consistent in use, it's not buying us anything, right? So, you know, the marvelous stuff that Ali's putting out there for the industry, right, in terms of here's, here's really a logical, defensible set of, you know, definitions for us to, to operate from, you know, that could be published and we could have, you know, major... Um, consortiums buy into it and that sort of thing. But until people are really applying it consistently, then it's not getting us what we need. And in order to get that, it has to be a point of emphasis in training and certification, right? And so um, I know that when ISACA's C-Risk certification was first being spun up, it caught a lot of flack from CIRA, right? And I don't know how, how folks in, in Sierra feel about it now. But when the C-Risk um, certification was being spun up, they invited me to be a part of it. And uh, I said I would only do it on one condition. And that condition was that the nomenclature and concepts around risk had to be consistent and logical. And um, much to my surprise, they agreed. And that was not a painless process because, and actually kind of, you know, as we were taking in suggestions for, for exam questions and that sort of thing, right, nomenclature in those questions were all over the board. And the people around the room on the committee for C-Risk, you know, I was the one in the room that was insistent on, on this, you know, consistent approach to how these things needed to be worded and the underlying concepts and how they were approached and that sort of thing. And so the other cooks in the kitchen didn't always agree. So there were a lot of knockdown, drag out fights, right? But the good news is the people at ISACA, and I have to give them all kinds of credit, they, they recognized or bought into um, the logic of my position and they fought with me. And at the end of the day, the nomenclature used in C-Risk is by and large, it's not perfect, but by and large it is way more consistent than anything else I see out there. All right? And their use of concepts all right? is, is way more consistent than anything else I'm familiar with. So think what you will about it in, in other respects, but in those, two, in those two dimensions, I think they did really, really well. And, and uh, so at any rate. But in general, in the industry, this has to take place more than just in one little certification before we really gain traction on this fundamental problem of nomenclature. Models and data. Um, so a lot of what we've talked about in here is about measuring risk, right? This is this has kind of been the focus. How much risk do we have? How much less risk will we have if that sort of thing? That is one half of the problem. Right? The other half of the problem is how did we come to have this much risk, and what do we need to do differently to manage it? Because risk management is something else that is measurable. Okay, because the decisions we made and our ability to execute against those decisions got us to where we are from a loss exposure perspective. And until we understand the relationships there and how they work together as a system, we, aren't, we can measure till the cows come home and we're still not gonna really improve. We have to understand the problem as a system, a living, breathing system. So we have to understand 
how decisions, right? I don't know how easy this is for you to read, but you know, decisions like policies and the processes we institute and the technologies we invest in and how we structure ourselves as an organization and how we make decisions for analysis and that sort of thing, all are put there for an intended state, albeit rarely very well defined, an intended you know, state of, of risk. Right? But what we actually get is a function of execution within the context of those decisions. All right? which is driven by how well they're communicated, supported, and enforced. You know, in other words, the awareness, capability, and motivation of people to do, you know, to follow that line, right? So this allows us then to see the, how these components begin to affect those, but it's still not a system. It's not a system until we have a feedback loop, all right? And when we think about how we operate as a profession, what information do we typically provide? If we think of just these elements up here, what do we think that we provide data to decision makers on? Primarily, what's our focus been as a profession? Control conditions, right? Deficiencies, that sort of thing, right? Very rarely talk about, in any meaningful terms, threat levels, right? kind of do some hand waving at it. We're getting better. There's beginning to be better threat intelligence out there, but historically it's been around control conditions. And you know, the big picture, how much risk, the combination of these three things and how much our loss exposure, uh, how much loss exposure we have, that's, you know, we don't, and that's why we're here as a, as a group, right, is to be better at taking this information and deriving this so that information is more meaningful, right? But here's the other thing we don't do, and this is a big part of what I refer to as risk management groundhog day. Right? How many people here have been to, how many people have heard me talk about risk management groundhog day before? A couple? Okay. So, um, you know, if you think about Bill Murray's movie on groundhog day, you wake up every day and it's the same, same problems over and over. So I did, I did a presentation at ISC Squared uh, last week, I guess, week before, called Dude Again, Really? Um, and I said, one of the clues that you're in Risk Management Groundhog Day is you utter that phrase, right? It's like, really? This again? I thought we fixed that, right? Well, no, you probably didn't fix it because you don't look at the root causes, right? And very often the root causes are, uh, uh, very often it's, the proximate cause very often is an execution failure. The root cause is very often something deeper. And very often that boils down to bad analysis, right? I'm finding more and more as I dig deeper in root cause analysis that a lot of it is the fact that decision makers are really badly informed, right? So if we can fix that, then we begin to break out of risk management groundhog day. The bottom line, the problem space is a system and we have to treat it that way. We have to understand how things relate to one another and such. So, you know, we talk about um, measurement and metrics and such. That is the feedback in the system. It should be. And it should be driving decisions. And if it's not, as somebody else said in here, if, if, if metrics aren't driving decisions, then what's the use? Why are you even bothering, right? So effective analysis, this notion, what do I mean by effective analysis? Well, it's accurate, useful, and be logically and rationally defended. That's kind of how I boil it down. Um, there's probably better ways of, uh, you know, or more academically astute ways of uh, putting it, but that's how it boils down for me. And factors that drive effective analysis, good models, good measurement, critical thinking skills, some of this I've already hit, and cleaning, uh, clear and meaningful objectives. If you don't have these things, then you're probably not going to end up with good analyses or effective analysis. So clearly defined objectives. Um, this is where I would like to see them. And again, it's not something I typically see in organizations. But uh, you know, it's in the organizations I work with, it's where I try to point them to. It's risk levels, you know, appetite with tolerances, sorts of questions. Um, and I have my own little mental construct definition or examples for risk, appetite, and tolerance. 
the, the analogy I like to use is, you know, speed limit on the road is a risk appetite statement. So some decision makers somewhere specified this based on, you know, um, the wear and tear on the road, lives lost, you know, these sorts of things. So there were considerations that said, all right, 35 miles an hour is the right speed limit here. The tolerance has to do with, all right, when are they starting to enforce things, right? So, you know, the, the enforcement of the cops may let you go five miles over or five, you know, or 15 miles under or whatever the case might be. But at some point, they're going, no, that's not okay. We need to start changing behavior, right? That's how I kind of view the, uh, the to difference between appetite and tolerance. Appetite is the line in the sand. Tolerance is when you start doing things to enforce a change in behavior. But, um, you know, priorities, having really clear priorities about, and, and this is really about being able to prioritize what we bring to the table, especially in the budget wars, right, versus what, say, the other parts of the organization are bringing. So if, if the sales and marketing people are bringing revenue projections and the operational folks are bringing costs associated with keeping lights on and the you know, quants and credit risk or whatever are, are bringing you know, quantified risk statements around what they do. And then we bring our heat maps, right? That's not a fair fight. We're either going to lose that fight if, if management is not uh, highly paranoid, right? Or we might win that fight inappropriately if they're highly paranoid and they spend money on us that they maybe shouldn't. Right? But either way, the organization loses, right? So being able to you know, prioritize effectively um, against these other parts of the organization is, I think, a big part of the objectives in explicit risk management. Um, and, and then I think, I forget who brought it up earlier. I don't want to miscredit. But nobody checks against, I think it was Douglas maybe in his presentation, he said, you know, people, even if they set an objective, very often they don't measure where they, whether they achieve that or not, right? And I see that all the time. So that should be a part of explicit risk management. Did we achieve what we set out to achieve? At the management level, it's priorities in order of execution. So it's a lower level of stratification and decision-making process. Uh, execution against levels of variance, that sort of thing and tactical solution outcomes, right? So these you know, are kind of areas where explicit objectives that we can, that can, you know, we can have measures to achieve and maintain to should come into play. So kind of the maturity continuum, and this is, that may be a little bit of a misnomer, but essentially there are things, and this is a very rudimentary sort of way to gauge where an organization is on maturity towards explicit risk management. But I'm not sure it needs to be too robust to get a picture and a sense of, all right, what do we need to work on? So nomenclature maturity. No standard nomenclature adopted. Everybody's all over the place. Standard nomenclature adopted, but inconsistently applied. All right, so we've decided this is what we're going to call risk, but you ask six people, you're still going to get some inconsistency in how they approach it or define it. And then, of course, standard nomenclature and consistently applied. So within the organizations where you work, how many people think they're in level three? Two. One. Yeah. I, would, I would argue most organizations are up in one. And again, in nomenclature, it needs to be clear, concise, and useful. It has to be relevant. Again, some of the definitions I see out there are truly horrible. Um, and, and, and you, you can't even understand them, let alone try to, try to live to them in any sort of sense or, or apply them. Um, so this is, if, you know, if we're going to talk about nomenclature, you need to be able to describe it, just as Ali did, in his, in his work in a way that is, is useful and relevant and, and logical and rational, right? And again, that seems to be in short supply. Um, risk concepts adoption. Because we can have great language, but if we don't understand the basic principles of risk and even simple probability sorts of things, 
then we're in a pretty tough spot from an explicit risk management perspective. So if people are unfamiliar with basic risk concepts, that's not good. All right, familiar ex familiarity exists, but it's inconsistent or consistent usage, appropriate usage. Again, fairly straightforward. But again, if we think about the organizations where we work in these terms, we're like, oh, well, we'll probably see some areas for improvement. Model maturity, mental models that are just kind of individual and who knows what, what they're comprised of and that sort of thing. Defined but unvetted, right? Or that don't stand up to any sort of logical sort of examination. Um, and then models that have been vetted in some fashion. And again, when we think about how organizations are typically operating and making decisions, you know, most of the time it's up here and with all, the, all that comes with that. Data maturity, no metrics or no purposeful metrics. A lot of organizations do metrics as simply a box checking exercise. You know, get the auditors and regulators off our back, all right? I was in an organization recently, they said, look at our metrics, and they gave me a stack, literally. Their information security metrics was a stack of paper like this. And so colorful. <laughs> it, was, it was so colorful. And I, I started flipping through this and I said, so how are you using this? And literally the answer was a blank stare. Using it? Um, well, <laughs> we give it to the auditors and regulators, so they get off our back is what it boiled down to. You know, and they spent, I don't know how much time went into developing and maintaining these metrics, but no decisions were being made using these metrics. You know, qualitative metrics, all right? Um, we've had lots of comments on that. And then quantitative metrics. But again, even, quantitative metrics still have to be the right metrics, right? And they have to be measured in, in sensical ways, right? So we can have quantitative metrics that are, are may, maybe it's just subject matter expert estimates. And if it's not calibrated, then I would say that's more like this. It might be in the form of numbers, but I bet it really is closer to this than, than this, right? So there's, there are qualifications for these. So objectives and maturity, objectives are undefined or ambiguous. How many people here have what they would consider to be ambiguous uh, objectives defined for the organization and information security? I would expect most hands to go up. They're defined, but they're qualitative. You know, we're going to, we're going to have operate our business at a medium level of risk. Okay. <laughs> Um, but that can still be helpful if it's done decently. It can still be helpful, right? It's, it's certainly not a perfect world, but it can be helpful. I've, I've seen, I did not, at first, when I first started thinking about this, I, I would have argued tooth and nail that qualitative objectives are, are window dressing and useless, but they can be helpful in, in some circumstances. But then if, if objectives are quantifiable, then that's, I would say, clearly better. So use of analytics. So all those other things are great. But if we aren't using the results of analyses, how many people in here have done analyses and they never got the light of day? No decisions were ever really driven by those analyses. Yeah, I've lived that life, all right? They're, how about they're used tactically, right? Kind of low-level decision-making. How about strategically? Yeah, it's, it's, it's the less common sort of thing, right? But, but this, is, this is the money game, I think, right? When we're able to make strategic decisions through good analysis and such, which is what we've been talking about, right? then that's where we gain the greatest opportunity for that cost-effective achievement and maintenance of, of our risk objectives. So the common executive questions that I run into, 
Um, Douglas had the exact same image on his slide deck. I saw that, I thought, man, I should have gone first. Uh, <laughs> so, or I could think of it, great minds think alike. Yeah, that's the one I'll choose. So, common executive questions, and this is gonna look familiar too. Are we spending enough or too much on information security? How many people have had that question posed? What are the most important concerns and are we on top of them? Are we keeping up with the evolving threats? What are our best risk management options? Okay, these are the questions I've encountered most as a CISO and then a, you know, on the dark side as a consultant. And all of these involve decisions based on comparisons it should be based on measurements of some sort. And it implies a desire to manage risk explicitly. When we get those questions, all right, I see no other way to interpret it than that they want to be able to explicitly manage risk. All right? But what they're expecting these days, by and large, in our world, are heat maps. That's what they're used to seeing from us as a profession. That's the expectation they've gotten. And they aren't insisting for something better, which is a shame. Until they start looking for something better, until they understand there is something achievable that's better, all right, then they aren't going to be expecting more. right? And a lot of our colleagues out there in the industry are going to be fine and dandy with just handing in their heat maps. They're not being asked to do anything more. They're not looking to take on additional something new and strange to them like quantitative analysis. So they're just gonna to continue to do heat maps. Until you know, the decision makers at the top understand what's really achievable, right, then we will continue, I project, to have a tough road to hoe um, in, in, in really getting wide scale adoption of quantitative methods in our industry. We have, we have to have some success stories. We have to have some people out there who've used it and just would never go back, all right? So summary, there are the three different kind of approaches to risk management. Uh, organizations will tend to lean one direction or another, um, but, but most of the organizations I encounter, virtually all of them, We'll be in that bottom horizontal spread somewhere. Um, risk management optimization requires explicit risk management. Um, there are some required foundational elements in, in order to get there, and organizations can gauge and track progress towards explicitness based on those foundational elements. So even something like a crude little three-point scales that I was showing you earlier, can be a starting point for where are we on this road to explicit risk management, and what are the things we need to have in place and be doing differently to get there, right? So what this means that, you know, based on even that simple sort of scale, it enables us to approach explicitness, <laughs> explicitly, <laughs> all right? But I mean, it is. I mean, it gives us something to, to kind of structure our progress against. So, any questions on that? Ready, I'm ready for you guys. Where are you? No questions. I don't hear snoring, so that's a good sign. <laughs> Going once. Going once. Thank you, okay. Patrick. Okay. I hate it. It wouldn't have been a Q&A session no questions, without you, Patrick. No, you're gonna get one. You're gonna, get a, you're gonna get a comment. Okay. I have heard you say in the past, and I think maybe just the circumstances of putting together the um, presentation, uh, a couple of things about the explicit approach. Um, one is that it's repeatable, which you know you, you didn't call out specifically. And, and another, and I don't know if you've ever talked about this or we are, we've ever talked about it, but uh, I was involved in explicit approaches in the analysis of medical outcomes. And one of the huge benefits of being explicit in your methodology and really what led to that 
very first email I sent you about FAIR so many years ago was um, you can debug your analysis if you've been explicit and documented it well. Uh, maybe it's unlikely in our space that you would run up against another analyst who reached a totally different conclusion, but you might. And when you're dealing with qualitative methods, uh, it's very hard to reconcile those kinds of differences. If you're, you're both dealing with a structured taxonomy and nomenclature, you can kind of work down or work up the trees and figure out where you diverged and at least understand why you don't agree. And I yeah, think that's absolutely. an important, a very important aspect of an explicit approach. Thank you. I appreciate your adding that. And I think that's absolutely true. And it's been my experience, too, because, you know, your point about two people doing an analysis, and that's one of the arguments, too, you'll get from skeptics is, oh, you can have two people do the same analysis, and they'll come to completely different conclusions. Not if they're using a common, you know, analytic framework and if their assumptions are the same, right? I have, I have very rare... I'm, I, I won't go out on a limb and say never, but I, I can't remember a time where two people have done an analysis, maybe in a fair training class or whatever the case might be, on the same scenario where the results were significantly different um, based on data. It was the differences have always been different assumptions. Um, and assumptions play such a critical role in analysis and, and having a, some sort of referential framework to think through the problem has been inc incredibly helpful for me um, in, in having the dialogue and working through those differences and that sort of thing. So you're absolutely right. Thank you. Let's give Jack a huge round of applause. Thank you, Jack.